Thank you very much, Bruce. And uh, so nice to see all friends and colleagues from all previous lives that I've had. Uh, it's great to see everyone here. Uh, thank, thank you very much for coming. I'm going to start with a story. This is a person called Aaron Schwartz. He was born in Boston in 1986. Some of you may have heard of him through a documentary that was made about him in 2014 entitled The Internet's Own Boy. If you haven't seen it, then I can't recommend it highly enough. It's free to watch on YouTube. The title is well chosen because what Aaron did through his involvement with a number of influential projects was to show how the democratic and creative potential of the internet could be realized. At age 13, he produced a version of Wikipedia before Wikipedia existed. He helped develop Reddit, one of the first social networking websites in 2005. He helped develop RSS technology that syndicates regularly published web, co web content like podcasts. And he worked on the computational and legal framework for Creative Commons, a form of copyright that means that you or I can easily draw on and reference the creative work of others. What drove him was a desire to make important information open and freely available so that collectively any one of us could build on the work of others. But that apparently straightforward aim got him into trouble. Many of us who work in universities and edit an academic journal, as I and, and Bruce do, we know that much, much of the research that we do is published in the form of journal articles or scholarly papers. To an outsider, academic publishing operates a strange model. We spend a great deal of time producing our articles in the research that we do, in the experiments we set up, the analyses we do, the way we write up our, our research into, into paper format. Once we do that, we then submit, submit our papers to be judged by our peers. If we are judged favourably, our paper is accepted and we release our copyright to the publisher. The publisher then sells our paper back to us, usually through the university library. So the extensive content we generate for publication is unpaid for by the publisher. <coughs> the work of peer reviewing to ensure academic quality is unpaid by the publisher. We waive our rights to re reproduce our own work, and then we are sent the bill in order to see what we've done. It's a bit of a crazy system. It's, it's changing a little bit, but the publishers make a lot of money from this process. The problem for Aaron Schwartz was that situating the very latest fundamental knowledge behind a paywall stops people outside of universities, as well as those in developing countries, being able to access and learn from and use that knowledge. He wanted to free knowledge so that anyone, not just academics like myself, could build on the insights of others. In other words, bring public access to the public domain. In 2011, Aaron was being tracked by the FBI. He'd already successfully used the power of social networking to challenge and halt the Stop Online Piracy Act going through US Congress that many thought could have dire con consequences for free speech. He'd also developed a system of automatically downloading large but inacce in inaccessible public document archives, like the Articles of US leg Legislation, bringing them into, pu into the public domain. And that clearly marked him out as someone the government, the US government, should keep an eye on. In January 2011, he found himself in a cleaner's cupboard at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, plugged into their computer network and automatically downloading thousands of academic journal articles for free distribution. He was arrested for state breaking and entering, which soon escalated to a number of feder federal indictments and charges carrying 35 years <coughs> imprisonment. Despite both MIT and the journal publishers later dropping their case against him, he was in the process of being prosecuted when he took his own life, aged 26. So this is a story of a powerful intelligence lost someone who had the ability to understand the structures and barriers that control information flows, someone who had the moral sense to realize that our progress is through sharing and creativity, and the computational and coding nous to be able to do something about it. In the middle of the film, I was drawn to one uh, particular scene, and you can see a still here of that, that scene. On the t-shirt that Aaron wears is a simple, perhaps idealistic phrase, design will save the world. What Aaron did shows many of the characteristics we normally think of as designing, understanding the formal and informal laws that govern our behaviours and trying through making new structures and forms to change the world for the better. I've chosen this example because 
if we think of what Aaron Schwartz was doing as designing, then there is no identifiable design discipline. There's no product, there's no furniture, there's no building, no vehicle, no clothing, no machine. All the things that we generally teach as design in our universities. The kind of design Aaron Schwartz was doing, the kind that addresses the nature of, what we, of how we do things as a society, that's politically charged, legally challenging, that questions corporate interest, but is democratically configured. This kind of design represents, I think, the problems that the 21st century imagination needs to be working on. But I've started at the end, so I'm gonna rewind to the beginning. <laughs> this is a photograph of me in 1968, taken by my dad, who's, who's here tonight. Uh, it's always useful having a photographer in the family for your in occasions like your inaugural lecture. In the photo, I'm already displaying an unhealthy attachment to the material world. In this case, advanced German engineering, an Auto Union 1000S Coupe with a wraparound windscreen. Back in the late 60s, that was Vorsprung Dirk's technique. That interest in the design world has stayed with me. And as Bruce mentioned earlier, after studying at Sussex University, which included my own brush with the criminal justice system and a night in a police cell, probably just 100 metres from this very spot, in the police station up the road. It's a long story. Uh, I worked as an engineering system designer and became fascinated in what I and others who call themselves designers actually do, particularly in the type of qualities and abilities they possess in solving design problems. To try and figure out those qualities and abilities, we could start by just looking at the things in the world around us. We could try to figure out how these things might relate to a designer or a design process and attempt to piece together the intentions behind them. And it's particularly tempting to ask what, what was the designer thinking, thinking of when things are difficult to use. And we've all probably got our own examples of really difficult to use things where you think, what the hell were they thinking when they designed that? Um, th so the world is filled with designed ob objects, tangible and intangible, as Bruce mentioned. So there's no shortage of things to choose from. Here's just one of them I found in a street market not far from here the other day. And I think it's a really, a really nice thing. Uh, it only costs 50 pence and there's a real simplicity to it. Basi basically, there's a switch, there's a, um, a motor. Uh, you switch, put the switch on, the motor goes. But the articulation of the switch has a sort of semicircular form. There's a kind of contrast in materials and colours. The two knurled knobs there that you can see uh, um, represent what's happening on the inside of the device. Um, and you can see here the, the, the rivets that are kind of nicely proportioned um, on the ex one of the external faces kind of represent what the battery compartments are doing inside. So there's a real kind of um, balance between the form and the, and the function of this, this device. You know, I kind of like the geometry of the thing. I like the way that the, the, the shapes kind of orientate, orientate to each other, the triangles, the circles, the way that the, the grill effect kind of looks like a car radiator. But for the life of me, I haven't able to, been able to find out who designed it. But by taking it apart and looking at it, I have some idea about how it might have been designed. Actually, you can even look at the world itself as a designed object. The philosopher David Hume, writing in the Enlightenment in the mid-1700s, produced a book called The Dialogues of Natural Religion. The book subtly knocks over what's called the argument from design. The idea that the world and everything in it is such a complicated and seemingly ordered thing that only a designer, and by implication a god, could have come up with it which proves God's existence. And you may have heard this argument on your doorstep at some point. Hume, while not denying that a designer had designed the world, in the 18th century he wasn't in a position to directly question the existence of God, instead explores the qualities that such a designer might have. The world might be a, just a poor copy of a previous world, he argues, and the designer a novice, or as Hume puts it, the world might be just quote, the, the first rude essay of an infant deity. The designer might not be a single designer at all, but a team of designers. And the designer might have long since passed away, no longer omniscient or omnipotent. The fact that the, de that is, the, fact that the design continues to exist doesn't mean that the designer does. 
So the designer of this electric fan, if it was one designer, may no longer be with us. And in any case, there are other things we don't know about the designer. We might be able to guess some of their influences and even have a guess at their gender, but things like their nationality, their level of education and experience, and indeed their practice itself means that intentions generally remain unknown. If we start from the world of things, the qualities and abilities of designers begin to take on a slightly mysterious and reverential air. There's a tendency to assign the term genius to designers, uh, genius to designers responsible for very successful designs, while discounting other key factors that may have contributed, like a good client or an intelligent manufacturer, for example. And most design work is, by definition, normal. So perhaps we should be looking to that if we are interested in the behavior of designers. So another way of looking at these qualities and abilities is to look at designers in action by studying the process of design. Over about 25 years, I've looked at quite a lot of design processes in many different disciplines. And what is striking is that so much time is devoted to things that don't exist, uh, talked about as if they do exist. All the conversations, sketches, models, schematics, diagrams, and visualizations are aimed at nailing down a fluid, not yet existing entity what we term the design. A colleague of mine called Peter Medway, who sadly passed away recently, used the term virtual to describe what it is that designers work on. Virtual buildings, virtual desk lamps, virtual pepper grinders, virtual websites. And he didn't mean it in the virtual reality sense of the term, but he meant it to mean almost or not quite. Or as my chamber's dictionary rather nicely puts it, quote, not such in fact, but capable of being considered as such for some purpose. Talking about things that don't exist might be taken as, a sign, taken as a sign of madness or delusion, but it turns out there are many ways that we can think and talk about the possible future, and that is what my, my research has mainly been focused on over the years. It strikes me that designers conduct very specific types of dialogue, and that understanding how these type, types of dialogue function are critical to understanding both what designing is as an activity and perhaps points the way to what designing could be in the future. I started my research career in the Department of Psychology at Sheffield University, trying to model design thinking using a fiendish artificial intelligence program language called Prolog, and attempting to produce what was then called a knowledge-based system, uh, a way that you, uh, a computer could access and process knowledge. I also work with videotape to study architects, product designers, and engineers. Unlike now, there wasn't much video of design activity around, and it wasn't that long ago. I asked them to solve design problems while getting them to think aloud in a procedure known as protocol analysis. And the theory behind protocol, protocol analysis is that thinking aloud gives us access to someone's immediate thoughts through their ability to verbalize the contents of their short-term memory as they carry out a task. That means we can follow a person's focus of attention and work out what information they're processing at any point. This is a sequence from an early study I did where I asked a number of architects to design a primary school on an existing site in Sheffield. And as the sequence unfolds, you can sort of see how the, arch uh, the architect is concentrating on sort of in interior organi organization, then generates a number of alternative um, forms and, and <coughs> positions for the school on the site, uh, looking at different types of access, pedestrian access, vehicular access, how the building will orient to that. Uh, and as she decides on a, a particular form, um, begins to put the organization back into, it, back into that form. There's a section there that you can see of the site and it gets more and more concrete. It's quite fluid. You can sort of see from the, from the sketching that it's uh, quite vague, but it gradually becomes much more of a concrete thing. And over the course of an hour, this, this, this was the, the result. Uh, sort of a, almost a fully realized primary school, which is an oppressive, a, oppressive way to spend an hour. And all the time she was, she was uh, thinking out loud. What you get in an experiment using protocol analysis is, a, is pretty garbled information. Participants aren't meant to try and make sense of what they say, just to say without thinking what comes into their mind. And normally there's a training phase where you have to get people to uh, do something and, and try to think out loud while they're doing it. From these verbal accounts, it's possible to identify the different cognitive mechanisms and strategies that designers use. For example, you can tell whether they're thinking about the problem in some way 
or thinking about a solution. I found that engineers think a lot more about problems while architects think much more in terms of solutions, though the very nature of design is that problems and solutions are connected in what's termed a wicked way. A wicked means that once you propose a solution, you start to develop a different idea of what the problem is. So in turn, that means the solution needs to change and so on and so on, as you work towards what's sometimes called the problem of the problem, so that you get these sort of superficial problems and then you think, ah, oh, they're all connected. There's this one underlying thing, the problem of the problem. And that, that characterizes design problems as opposed to sort of more goal-directed goal problem solving, like um, solving a puzzle or solving a crossword, where there's a very clear solution. In design, you get a, a range of solutions uh, that are kind of more or less okay. Um, but you don't know when you've actually got a solution. There's not an optimal solution. But there are limitations with this method of trying to verbalize thought. As you saw in the sequence, the design process is, isn't just verbal, but visual. And it doesn't take long to realize that the verbal and the visual work together. And also that this process is pretty impossible to model on a computer. This is a graph from another study I did, this time with an industrial designer designing a bicycle access accessory. The method of asking designers to think out loud means that you have to continually remind them to keep doing it. And the graph illustrates what happens when you do. The line shows how the verbal rate, the rate of talking in terms of words per minute, and I'm talking about 120 words per minute, I think, decreases almost to zero as the designer prepares the sketch. And what this shows is that the visual has taken over short-term memory to such an extent that it's squeezed out the ability to verbalize. The designer has gone into a different way of thinking entirely. When prompted to think out loud again, he abruptly stops his sketching activity and starts verbalizing again. You can see around uh, um, two minutes and four there. The, the verbal rate rises up and it, it, it evens out again about 100 words uh, a minute. So the method of trying to access the thing we we're interested in, verbalization, interferes with the process we are trying to access, the design process. And that's because design is much more than a task of short-term memory. It's a process that draws heavily on experience. Memories and patterns buried deep in long-term memory, or even, if we were to get Freudian or Jungian, in the unconscious or the collective unconscious. It's also, it's also a process where thought is externalized. In the primary school example, the sketching provides a way for the designer con to converse with herself, to project outwards in order to project back inwards again. The sketches help her to learn about a possible future and to develop a more accurate way with dealing, of dealing with it and shaping it. She can say, the door could be here. No, wait, let's put it over there. How would that work? She can move a door around in seconds. That's amazing. There are the, these are the kinds of questions that a designer seeks to answer by externalizing their thoughts into sketches, diagrams, models, prototypes, and computer visualizations. The educationalist Donald Schoen describes it as having a reflective conversation with the materials of the situation. What designers do with the words they speak is to try and make sense of them, to use them in their process of designers' things to think with. So what starts out as a simple method of verbalization to access pure thought turns into another version of the design process itself, an external projection that drives inward reflection, a dialogue with self, in other words. This idea of projection becomes much clearer when you step out of the laboratory and into the commercial world of design. If you walk into a design office and sit in design meetings, as I did for a number of years, or even just quietly observe what's happening in the corner, you experience lots of talking, lots of conversations, lots of pointing, showing, describing, lots of collaborating. The models, represent representations, sketches and schemes are still there but they're overlaid with a talk that explores their integrity, their meaning, their look and feel, the way they work. That's a, a word that you often, often hear. Is it working? How does it work? What, what does, this, does this diagram work? Does this sketch work? These arrangements and details matter. And at the heart of any design process is choice between alternatives, the generation and weighing up of problems and solutions. Is it better like this or like that? Should the door be here or should it be there? Maybe a combination of both. It's also a process where there is an inherent uncertainty, while the implications of various alternatives are worked through. You saw that with the architectural sketches I, I showed earlier, where there was a number of alternatives generated without really knowing where the process was going. So designers have to be comfortable with that uncertainty 
Um, and the romantic poet Keats called this negative capability, to quote him, capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. It's just that case where you're just happy not knowing where the, where the outcome is, uh, is, is leading or not, happy, not being forced to go down a certain route. So designing is speculative, but it's also much more of a social activity, activity than a cognitive one, a process of garnering agreement between different parties and disciplines. People come to a design process with different sets of professional expertise and experience, architects, project managers, uh, structural engineers, product designers, interaction designers, manufacturers, coders, software engineers, all come with a language of their own. Larry Bucciarelli, a colleague of mine from MIT, refers to these languages as object worlds, where an individual's disciplinary experience has the sheen of being objective. It's a kind of subject, subjective objectivity. So you, you, you think what you're, 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 you're talking about is objectively true, when really you're, you're, you're offering a version, a version of, um, of something. So in a design process that involves other disciplines, there are many different versions of what objective is. That's what demands negotiation and agreement. A new world around the problem and solution has to be constructed, and that's usually first formed in discussion and in language. As before, words become verbal sketches, outward projections to think with, though this time in a social context. So it is dialogue with others rather than dialogue with self that develops. You can get some sense of this in the conversation I've shown here from a study I did some years ago where I literally sat in the corner of an engineering design company for a number of weeks and generated a, a huge amount of data. I've uh, scanned one sheet in the background there. We had, um, we had many, many sheets, sort of 200 pages of, of conversations that were sort of transcribed and um, meetings and, co and telephone conversations. So the, the segment on the right is from a meeting that was called to discuss problems in the design of a rolling road. A rolling road is something that tests a, car, a car's performance for, the, for those that don't know. And yes, if you're asking the same type of rolling road that some Volkswagens detected so they could automatically activate their infamous defeat device to fool the emission testers, which is a clear illustration of how design decisions are ethical in nature, something to which I'll come back to later on. I won't read the example through, but you can see the form of the exchange. A subjective Stroke objective account is first given that narrates a technical problem. A discussion takes place exploring possible solutions involving techni technical principles, client perceptions, and later on, aesthetics. It's amazing how often engineers use aesthetic language to describe what they like, their preferences, their judgments. There's a lot of aesthetic talk in engineering. In other words, the type of conversation that plays out every day in all types of design organizations up and down the country, the normal design that I referred to earlier. In the agreements that are made, a language develops relating the form of the emergent thing to the thoughts and discussion that goes into furthering that form. The problem you see discussed here is later collapsed into a phrase on the first line of that segment, balancing the lift edge. And that acts as an economical shorthand in referencing the discussion in later conversation. And these words and phrases are constructed as the virtual thing itself is constructed and they appear everywhere in design discourse. Another example comes from a more recent project I did together with Professor Mc ja uh, Janet McDonnell from Central St. Martins. The project followed the design process of a new crematorium in Milton Keynes over a number of years. So we tracked the whole process sort of from, from the beginning um, with the initial thoughts of the architect right through, to the, uh, right through to the end. And the building's now finished and operational. And this is one of the early vi visualizations of the crematorium. And I've circled the area here that received quite a lot of discussion in an early design meeting with a client, that's the waiting area. Waiting in a crematorium isn't as straightforward as it sounds. The waiting area can be emotionally charged, reflective or more routine. Sometimes informal or even formal segregation is necessary as people meet who may not have seen one another for some time and may not even like each other. And waiting time, though often short, can be variable. So some people come out and wait for taxis, other people are waiting for services to come in. So it's quite a complex activity waiting. Over the course of 10 minutes or so in the meeting, the waiting area and the idea of waiting expands to take on quite a number of dimensions, meanings and associations. First it's small, then it's made larger, before finally being decreased in size again. 
It's first a simple space, then a more complex arrangement with an external waiting space added for a time. This is in a design meeting discussing the possibilities, the waiting space. Again, the word waiting is loaded with meaning and association as the design process progresses, carrying the ideas for the waiting space that have been discussed. The concept of waiting is thus constructed and refined as solutions are explored and the problem, de the problem develops. <coughs> As we saw before in the dialogue with self, the words, and language, the words and language are not extraneous to the design process, but constitutive of it. They function to explain, to describe, to evaluate, to tell stories, to articulate and capture experience. And they not only refer to and, refer to and relate solution forms, they are themselves solution forms. And here is Peter Medway again at a conference I organized in 2001. And he says, quote, Architects assume that all the associations and meanings and metaphorical connections get communicated through the drawings and then through the built structure. And that's not necessarily the case, which is why many buildings don't have the effect that was intended. I'm just struck by the narrowness of the funnel that this whole thing has to get through before it goes out into the world. What leaves the office is so ascetic, so stripped down, so tenuous and attenuated, compared with this huge great mass of associations and metaphors. It's like, do not inflate your life jacket before you leave the aircraft. So he uses this kind of metaphor of blowing up this life jacket, but you've got to kind of pack it down and put it through the door to get the, the, the design thing out in the world. What the quotation describes, although about architectural design, could be about a design process in any discipline. It could equally apply to other disciplines as, or practices where things get done through the production of things. Disciplines where plans get made, texts get produced, menus get written, music gets played, experiments get conducted. There's plenty of design activity that takes place without an official designer being present. The blog I write records some of this designing outside of recognized design disciplines. At the beginning of this lecture, I talked about the design hacktivism of Aaron Schwartz, but there are other diverse examples. Satoshi Nakamoto is the person who created Bitcoin a currency that doesn't need a bank or a government to certify and guarantee its value. I'll repeat that, Bitcoin doesn't need a bank or a central reserve to give it exchange value. That's pretty, a pretty interesting idea, I think. Nakamoto is a specialist mathematician, a cryptographer, or someone who makes and cracks codes. Bitcoin itself is essentially a cryptographic algorithm that generates a chain of numbers called the blockchain. They're very special numbers, like prime numbers, but they're numbers, and each individual Bitcoin is mined by a computer, much like the search for ever higher prime numbers. It takes more and more computing power to, to reach the next uh, prime number. In an echo of David Hume in the argument from design earlier on, the identity of Nakamoto, if indeed it is one person, remains a mystery. One of the few remarks she, or he, or them, have made about producing the Bitcoin currency, however, was that, quote, much more of the work was designing rather than coding. There are a whole host of aspects to payment transactions and just coming up with the basic cryptographic code. The facility to quickly verify authenticity, making the code hack proof, as well as keeping it simple and easy to use, are just some of the aspects that need to be designed into the currency. It has to be user centered in other words. An entirely different example of design outside of traditional disciplines comes from football. I was intrigued by the following recent quote from the Arsenal manager, Arsene Wenger, about one of his midfield players, Mesut Ozil, shown in the photo. The quote runs, Wenger thinks the player he bought for a club record of 42.5 million pounds from Real Madrid two summers ago is readier than he has ever been to excel, to design the game consistently and decisively. How do you design a game of football while you're playing it? I would suggest that through trial and error, through collaboration, through an imaginative, imaginative engagement with self and others, through a conversation with the materials of the situation. The two aspects of the design process that I've described, the dialogue with self and the dialogue with others, also serve to under underline that these are, to a greater or lesser extent, aspects of everyone's behaviour when we try and think about things in the future. What I'm suggesting is that much of our activity, both in our professional lives and our personal lives, could be considered as designing. 
A friend and colleague of mine, Nigel Cross, has coined the term designerly in arguing for designing as a distinct form of intelligence, drawing on Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences. And this intelligence, this design intelligence, is present to some extent in, in us all, a way of dealing with the world by changing it, thinking about problems by proposing solutions. How might we build on this insight? Why do we need to teach people how to design if they already have the ability to do so? The answer is partly a technical one. The language or object worlds represented by disciplinary knowledge do form a necessary part of professional design processes, but they are not sufficient in my view, particularly as non-designers, clients and users, for example, generally play important roles in any design process. Having these people with a greater understanding of what designing is, particularly being comfortable in that space of uncertainty that any design process opens up, that idea of negative capability, that allows a richer, more productive dialogue to take place. Partly the answer is also about the development of any intelligence. If one spends time working at it, like learning to play a musical instrument, one gets, one gets better at it. That doesn't mean that everyone ends up as a professional designer, but it does mean that the general understanding and appreciation for design increases. With this in mind, while I was at the Open University, before I came to Brighton, I led a large team of academics and developers in putting together an online course in design thinking. The picture shows the creative welcome pack that students receive through the post at the beginning of the course. Uh, and the idea behind this was to take objects that might be familiar to them and kind of make, make them a bit strange. So the two rolls of masking tape that you can see, sort of see, the provocation was that this is a way, this is a, a, a way to draw. So you can represent things with masking tape, big things on, on the ground because students are generally very scared of drawing. So it's getting over that barrier. Um, this was the only thing they did receive during the course because the rest of the course was entirely online. The idea behind the course was to teach the methods of design and designing in a contextual way. A way where people could frame and solve design problems within the confines of their daily lives, at work, at play or at home. And you should remember that most students that study with the OU um, do so part-time while they, while they work. Since two, 2010, when the course launched, a huge diversity of more than 3,000 people have completed the course and from all walks of life. Teachers, librarians, health workers, people in business, military personnel, people in prison, even an 80-year-old Scottish shepherd have developed their skills of thinking like a designer. This is a kind of design education where people learn to build on the work of others through online connections. An education that uses the creative power of a network as its educational engine. Well-known designers have also proposed curriculum for teaching design. In 1957, the American Design Partnership of Charles and Ray Eames, whose work is currently on show in an excellent exhibition at the Barbican, were asked by then Indian Prime Minister Nehru to look at how the poor quality of Indian consumer goods could be improved. They came up with this, the India Report, proposals for an institute and curriculum for design education and shown here. At just 15 pages, the report is said to have outraged those who commissioned it. But in the way that it lays out ideas about students, staff, projects, methods, estates and impact, it's a model of economy and clarity. In its sparseness is its beauty and in its beauty is its longevity. The report and its recommendations remain right up to date and not just for India. This is one of their introductory remarks, and remember this is 1957, quote, the change India is undergoing is a change in kind, not a change in degree. The medium that is producing that, this change is communication, not some influence of the West and East. The phenomenon of communication is something that affects a world, not a country. That phrase could equally apply to modern day America in the age of the internet. And I was interested to find that some universities are rethinking not just how we educate designers, but how we redesign the university itself. This book came out this year and describes the design process by which Arizona State has grown into America's largest public university, while increasing inclusivity, the, the range of students that it takes on, and moving into the top tier of American research universities. The authors, one of whom is the president of the university, addressed a simple problem. In a higher education market where the top research institutions are highly selective 
in who's allowed to study with them. If you think of Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Stanford, MIT, how difficult it is to get into those institutions. How is it possible to extensively widen access to higher education, but also improve research quality? So generally, uh, if you take on more students, the research quality goes down, but how is it possible that you can, you can raise both things? In other words, how do you expose people from more disadvantaged backgrounds, perhaps people who haven't had the chance to develop as they might have, to leading research ideas, to new knowledge. Aaron Schwartz had one solution to this, to shepherd that research from those highly selective institutions into the public domain. But Arizona State have designed another, under the banner of one university in many places, including online places, and a trebling of funding for interdisciplinary research addressing so-called grand challenges, which actually isn't so far from what we do at University of Brighton. So perhaps this is a book that we're already be beginning to write, uh, building on the foundations that Bruce and others have, have laid down. The internet has changed the way we do many things, for good or ill. But most of all, it has put us into, a new, in, into both a new relationship to knowledge and provided new ways in which we can access and crucially design access to that knowledge. The things we know are increasingly outside of our heads. A young designer goes to Google now the new version of long-term memory and collective unconscious. We're better informed than we've ever, ever been, but that has somehow made the problems of our time and the solutions to those problems more elusive than ever. We continue to think in disciplines. This is a picture from St Andrews University, one of those selected, selective institutions. On the left is the entrance to the Department of Moral Philosophy. On the right is the entrance to the Department of Logic and Metaphysics. Two branches of philosophy, and all those years, staff and students have made one choice or other. Morali morality on the one hand, logic on the other. And the, the moral philosophers clearly uh, are more anxious. They have the smoking apparatus out the front. Uh, and this choice is reinforced by the structure of the university and the difficult to move doors that are very obviously here and there. It seems to me that our problems don't understand these disciplines. The problems of climate change, gender inequality, global finance and education, to name a few, have a complex dynamic of their own. The internet, and particularly Creative Commons, has pointed the way to some of the solutions. The organisation and website TED, which stands for Technology, Entertainment and Design, has given us a broader idea of how design can traverse and connect disciplines. And the open source movement, where anyone can contribute to a large pro larger project like Wikipedia and even WikiHouse has given us new models of how we can work online and offline collaboratively and productively and where outcomes are continually evolving. We don't just need to be developing solutions though, we need to be framing and working on the right problems. The trickiest, most important problems always involve established interests in the political, legal, corporate, social and technical spheres. Framing those tricky problems requires imagination and that's perhaps one of the most effective aspects of design thinking, to help us see problems outside of traditional disciplines, disciplines and categories, and to propose new forms, new shapes, new structures, new transitions with which we can address them. The Design Council's Designer of the Year in 2007 was someone called Hilary Cotton. The award sparked a big debate in the design industries because Hilary wasn't a conventional discipline-based designer. She works on thorny public service projects addressing prison reform, urban poverty, loneliness and unemployment. She does this by drawing in traditional design expertise when it was needed, using it alongside other types of knowledge, particularly the knowledge of those who might contribute or be affected by the design she works on. It's a sort of inclusive participa participatory process that she operates. The shape of her solutions lead more to social arrangements than physical form putting people in new relations to one another and strengthening good connections. When I interviewed her for a research project a few years ago, she told me she was given her Designer of the Year award by the famous German designer Dieter Rams, whose influence on modern design through his work for Braun is huge, not least through being an inspiration for the head of design at Apple, Jonathan Ive. Dieter Rams told her, this is really, really exciting because the best chair and the best shelf have been built now. So let's use these skills for shaping society. Design affects us pretty much every minute of every day in all kinds of things. Traffic flows and ticket machines, computers and cars, electric fans and electricity bills, mobile phones and mobile homes. 
It's all designed. These things regulate and mediate our behaviours. They nudge us one way or another towards this door or that one. The process of design has consequences for us. Mostly these are well-intentioned consequences, but this direct effect on our behaviour, along with the fact that unintended consequences often arise, I'm thinking about that Volkswagen defeat device again, means that designing can also be understood as an ethical activity. Some of you may have heard of a philosopher called Mark Johnson, who wrote a very influential book together with his co-author, George Lakoff, called Metaphors We Live By. It's a careful and convincing analysis of how our language draws on root metaphors, the way we describe it as a, an argument in terms of war, for example, a conflict metaphor, or the way we couch the idea of understanding in terms of seeing, a visual met metaphor. These metaphors carry with them basic <coughs> values and associations, and one doesn't have to look at a design process for long to realise that the metaphors play a large part. They help to inflate that life jacket of the earlier um, quote, quotation, the metaphors, associations, they sort of build up through a design process. Indeed, the basic functioning of a metaphor, the way that one thing can be thought of as another, often appears as the driving creative force behind a design process. A later work by Johnson focuses on the idea of moral imagination. And towards the end, he describes how such a faculty like this can be developed. And to quote him, he says, we must cultivate moral, moral imagination by sharpening our powers of discrimination, exercising our capacity for envisioning new possibilities and imagin imagin imaginatively tracing out the implications of our metaphors, prototypes and narratives. Possibilities, metaphors, prototypes, narratives. That sounds like design thinking to me. That link be between design and ethics in terms of a thinking process underlines the importance and potential of design both as a valuable activity in itself to develop our thinking about possible futures and as something that will save the world, as the t-shirt says. This is design outside of traditional disciplines, a creative and essential element to every discipline, a way of opening up our future, not closing it down. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>